Hello and welcome to the 2023 Advisory Board Meeting for the Chemical Technology Program at Kate Fear Community College. My name is Tracy Holbrook. If you've never had a chance to meet me, then my picture is here in the bottom right-hand corner. And we operate under the General Education and Sciences Division at Cape Fear. The Chemical Technology Program has been around for quite some time. If you are new to the board, I want to welcome you. If you are a regular face, then I want to thank Thank you for continuing to serve on our advisory board. So this year's meeting is formatted a little differently. What you're going to find is two halves. The first half is going to focus on our coursework and the program format. And then the second one is going to focus on our equipment and instrumentation capabilities. So what we would like for you to do, we would like for you to watch both of these videos, of course, take some notes, kind of get the gears churning, and then I'm going to end each one of these halves with a series of questions. After these videos get released, then Shawnee, who is our program liaison, will reach out to each and every one of you. And she will maybe schedule a meeting at your site location where we can actually come to you, sit down, and discuss and talk about the things that you have learned or the changes that have happened within the ChemTech program and any advice that you might have. Because this is an advisory board. You're supposed to advise us on certain things that we need to do. And that needs a conversation. So we're going to make it easy for you particularly this year, we're going to make it easy and we're coming to you. You do not have to come to us. Now, if you still want to come to campus, you're more than welcome. The invitation is out there. We will walk you around our laboratory spaces if you've not seen it in a while. Um, we'll maybe meet in a conference room and talk and discuss about certain topics that you want to bring to our attention. And you're also more than welcome to bring more than just you to the table. So if you've got a laboratory manager, if you have an HR person, uh, whatever the case is, whoever makes these decisions or whoever you think needs to be in the loop with what's going on at ChemTech at Cape Fear Community College, you're more than welcome to invite them and bring them to the meeting as well. All right, so with that said, this video is going to quickly start off with our summary of the program description. So for some of you, again, this might be the first time that you've served on our board and you're probably wondering, well, what on earth is chemical technology? Well, we're the only chemical technology program in the entire state of North Carolina. And here is a summary of what we do. So this is verbatim the wording. And if there's anything in this wording that you as an advisory board member would like for us to change or update, well, you are more than willing to share that, uh, share those thoughts, share that information with us, and we will make those appropriate changes. The chemical technology curriculum prepares individuals for work as analytical technicians. All right, so the very first thing that I'm going to say is that we do more than teach students what a beaker and a graduated cylinder is. All right, I'm, and I'm going to say that again. We are more than teaching students basic laboratory glassware and techniques. We go so far and above and beyond that. And an analytical technician is the way that I regard this program. And that means that if I go to a bachelor's or a master's route and I specialize in analytical chemistry as far as making standards, making solutions, running things on pieces of equipment, analyzing the data, figuring out concentrations. Folks, this is all Excel work. It's all math work. It's all analytical chemistry. That is what we are. We are a miniature analytical chemistry program. That is where your mindset needs to be, and that is how we address this program as well. So analytical technicians in chemical labs associated with chemical production, environmental concerns, pharmaceuticals, or general analysis. Uh, coursework includes general chemistry, right? and I'm going to talk more about this in just a minute. Organic chemistry, more about that a little bit later as well. Introductory chemical engineering qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis, and instrumental techniques such as spectroscopy, UV-Vis, IR, AA, and chromatography, GC, LC, and so forth. Not everything is listed there, but those are giving some examples. Students also utilize computerized data collection, aka Excel. We are very heavily Excel-oriented. 
For data collection and graphic presentation, graduates should qualify as entry-level chemical laboratory technicians. Their duties may include chemical solution prep, raw material, product or environmental sampling, and or sample testing via wet chemistry or instrumental techniques. So our graduates, we feel very comfortable, could run circles in a wet laboratory area or an instrumentation area. And I think that's where you're going to find us begin to change a little bit. So I want you to think about those typical bachelor's of degree science students, those BS students that you are getting ready to kind of maybe come through your door, go through your HR program, and they're gonna give you a lot of BS on what they basically know and do not know, right? And I say that very jokingly, but what we are experiencing, especially with the employers that are reporting back to us is that these bachelor's degree candidates, they really are not bringing to the table what they need in order to be very efficient or knowledgeable in the laboratory sciences. And our students, they are now experiencing and they realize that they are ready to work on day one, whether that is in a wet laboratory course, because that's where our students are at, whether that's in instrumentation, because our students have a whole year of that type of training, or whether it's in some type of quality control setting or spreadsheets or calculations, uh, some type of role like that, our students fit into that category as well. Uh, in addition to that, our students know lingo and terminology that these bachelor people, uh -uh, they don't, they really don't. So again, we try to make strides and we try to persuade, and maybe I say that word in a wrong way. We don't try to persuade. We know, but we try to convey this message that there's more than just a bachelor's degree candidate that's qualified to do the job that you want them to do at your employer. And we hope that you continue to look at our uh, associate's degree candidates and our graduates. We hope that you continue to look at chemical technology as a program route that is perfectly suitable for your employer and what you need to do. So that is our summary. That is how it's listed at the state level. Again, any changes here that you think are necessary, any updates, any statements that you would like to see, anything that you would like deleted, please let us know and we will make um, arrangements to have those corrected for the upcoming year. So let's start talking about our classes. And the first one that we're going to talk about is CTC 110 Chemical Safety. Uh, first off, uh, this is a fully online course because we believe that chemical safety does not have to be done in person. So in our online courses, what students would experience would be something that you are experiencing right now. It is a recorded video that our faculty and staff do. They are not outsourced. They are not found on YouTube and that type of thing. We do them. We record them just like we would in lectures. And then we deliver those videos to our students to participate in slowly over the course of a semester. And then with that comes various online assignments. Some of them could be timed where they are limited to the amount of notes that they can refer back to and they can't Google everything on the internet. And then others are very open-ended. So they can open these assignments up, work on them when it's convenient for them, save it, go back, reopen it, and and uh, continue on throughout that process throughout the semester. So it really just depends on the assignment, but I do want you to know that the quality of the course is our very first mission. That is where we put all of our heart and soul into the online courses. So we think that this needs to be driven by CT faculty and staff at Cape Fear and not by other people that we're finding on the internet. So topics include chemical handling and storage and disposal, OSHA, SDS, laboratory organization and hygiene, first aid, hazard preventative measures, summary of common instrumentation. So this is a two hour course per week. So two hours of lecture material and students will watch these videos, complete the assignments. And I want you to think of that safety agreement at the very beginning of the semester in a general chemistry course. All of the bullets that you, we have to go through, you know, no um, open toed shoes and make sure your hair is pulled back. Those types of things we go into in great detail throughout the course. A little bit of first aid is in this as well, a little bit of preventative measures, a 
as far as what to look out for when you're in our laboratory, where are the hazards located, what can we do to minimize those, and so forth. That is what this is all about. And then there's a portion of the chemical safety class that is a summary of all of the common instrumentation that students will see in the upcoming two years while they're with us. So this 110 course is only offered in the fall, and it's typically one of the first classes that students take when they enroll in the ChemTech program. All right, next, we also have in that very same semester a course titled CTC 114, and that's wet laboratory techniques. So CTC 114 is also one of the first classes that students will take, and there's no prereqs to this at all. We take anyone that's interested in the program. You do not have to have another science completion. You don't have to have a math completion or anything. We take anyone at any time in the fall and the spring semester, and this is the fall semester course that students would experience, most of them, the very first semester while they're with us. So I want you to think of this course as a very basic intro to laboratory testing. And we focus on the basics and we do not take anything for granted. So if you're a Food Network star, back to basics with Ina Garden. That's me, right? We're going to go back to the basics and we're not going to make anything or uh, make any assumptions at all with what these students know and what they don't know. If they know it, then good for them, but they're going to experience it again all over. So most of these laboratory experiments are going to concern physical and chemical property tests. Use of a volumetric pipette, using a micro pipette the proper way, boiling points, measuring or melting points, refractive index, density, specific gravity, qualitative test, gravimetric analysis, recrystallization, separation, polarimeter, titrations, and then finally we end that semester with dissolution and disintegration, and we call that DND. You might do that as well if you do dissolution and disintegration, but those are our DND tests. And, you know, that goes back to my 80s childhood when I began to play Dungeons and Dragons, right? Maybe you've heard of Stranger Things. You might be a fan, but, you know, that brings back some memories. So CTC 114, Wet Laboratory Technique. Uh, a lot of these um, are very basic laboratory-driven types of experiments. Nothing fancy, nothing up our sleeves just very cut and dry for the most part. But at the same time, what we are getting ready to do with the 114 course is that we actually begin to weave USP monographs into this um, course as well. And the reason that we do that is because, for instance, qualitative analysis, well, that's great. It's observations based. A student in a bachelor's degree level or with us in the very beginning would see qualitative tests and it's like, add a few drops here, add a few drops there and tell me what it does. And then students are kind of perplexed because they're like, well, where does this really play into real life? Well, in real life, qualitative tests are used in a lot of the identification tests that are in the USP. So we want to make that connection very, very early on. And in addition to that, we follow up the USP at a different course at a different um, uh, semester. But this is their first intro or their first date with these types of topics and these types of ideas, right? Refractive index and density, melting points, boiling points, all of those are corroded in the USP. So it gives us a very good chance to start pulling those out and start exposing students to this knowledge base that really a bachelor's degree or a master's degree candidate might not have in and their learning tool belt when they apply for a job with you. All right. Uh, titrations down here below. These titrations we spend about um, two months on, actually. Just different types of titrations, not the typical acid based titration every single time that a student might see in general chemistry. What we'd like to regard here is that if a laboratory is introduced in a normal chemistry course, and for us that's 151 and 152, we want to go above and beyond that. We don't want to replicate it, but we want to add to it. So, because of that, what students will see with us are some more advanced type of topics than what they would get in a general run-of-the-mill chemistry course or organic chemistry class, all right? Uh, dissolution disintegration, again, just to kind of change up the semester a little bit there, especially at the end. Dissolution and disintegration, typically like one of the first major pieces of equipment that students get to use as far as big things that sit on our countertop. 
Uh, polarimeters, you'll see this in some of our equipment um, uh, lectures and slides. Uh, we have automated polarimeters, we've got automated refractometers, we've got automated density meters, we have automated uh, melting point systems. So we pretty much have what's needed and we try to line up um, our instrumentation with what they might find in a real working laboratory. The Wet Laboratory Technique course, this is two hours of lecture a week, and then there's six hours of laboratory a week. So that means that we see these students a total of eight hours every single week throughout a 16-week semester period. Uh, so that will give you a little bit of insight about how much hands-on experience these students will uh, undergo throughout the course of one semester. Uh, following that is our spring semester, and students will then enroll in 115. There's also no prereq to this course, actually. So again, any student that wants to enroll and begin our chemical technology program can do so in spring or in fall. It's really up to them. But CTC 115 is something that we call quality control. This is a very sneaky pharma-based course. And in the pharma, I'm specifically talking about the monographs here. This is a way that we can talk about statistics because we do. Down here, you'll see that topic listed as well as very heavy Excel for this particular semester. But we talk about averages and standard deviations and confidence intervals and relative standard deviations and percent relative standard deviations and statistically comparing two methods with each other and statistically showing if we can kick out a data point and statistically showing if there is a difference between the data that's getting generated maybe between two different methods or two different people for the method. All of these we talk about throughout the entire semester. But the quality control class is more than just math. It's also about very heavy USP monograph. So students are reading the monographs. They're going through maybe preparing some of the monograph reagents um, or at least figuring out where those recipes are going to be located. Uh, we do not provide them any online format of USP. And that's because that's cha-ching! money and that's money that we can save and use somewhere else but the monographs that we focus on are usp ep fcc we just recently received copies of jp as well as the uh, british pharmacopoeia so those will be introduced slowly throughout the upcoming versions of the 115 class we talk about dissolution and disintegration again of course that's going to be in the usp monographs and part of quality control polarimeter, refractometer, melting point, boiling point, density, specific gravity, titrations, including Carl Fisher titrations, GC, HPLC, UV, FTIR, HPTLC, folks, the answer is yes, HPTLC we do have, and that is now getting found in the monograph, so we might as well use it, we might as well have it, so that way we can provide our students training. Uh, identification test, assay test, and then we end that semester, it's not full blown all pharma but there's some environmental methods that are in there as well two of which are 115 and 300.1 and these are the total organic carbon analyzer as well as our anions and ion chromatography systems so students will follow those methods they will completely do a full qc batch with all of the qc guidelines that are stated in that method and they will make sure that their batch passes before they release any of the data from the batch. You show me a bachelor's degree candidate or a master's degree candidate that will do that or that will know that. Show me someone that knows the definition of standard additions and internal standards and laboratory duplicates and field duplicates and surrogates because I guarantee you there's going to be very few of them that get that exposure. And that is what this class is all about. It is quality control in a laboratory. How do we ensure that our data is quality? quality data before we release that to any person whatsoever. So this particular course is two hours of lecture and it's six hours of lab, giving us a total of eight hours in total that we see the students for this particular semester as well. Uh, these are not the only two environmental methods though. We do things like total dissolved solids in this course. We do uh, uh, total suspended solids, so TDS and TSS, we do those uh, as well. Um, we also kind of do pH of soil. So there's a little bit environmental, but those are mainly method-based. 
And then the majority of the class is the USP monographs uh, with all of the different types of testing that will show up in the monograph period. All right. Uh, next is uh, the 150 course. And this is also in the spring semester. And this is completely online. So once again, students see us for one class in person face to face. And then they're taking another class that's fully online recorded like this uh, just exact format of students looking at my notes, explaining how to do problems. And this course is all about math, molarity, formula weights, parts per million, parts per billion, normality, uh, internal standards, standard additions, making calibration curves, a little bit more about statistical parameters. That is what this class is all about. So standard addition, internal standards, calibration curves. Folks, this is typically like an analytical chemistry course that you might see at a bachelor's level, and students are getting this with us in their second semester in the program. So we accelerate that quite a bit in the very forefront of the program because these things they will use from this point on in the future classes. We also focus on solution preparation. So how do we do the math to calculate the actual things that we need to make? And how do we not rely on a recipe for us to uh, kind of follow and tell us the amounts and grams and milliliters uh, and those types of things? So that is our 150, again, fully online. And this is two hours a week. That's what this is. All right. Okay, so uh, next up, uh, students will then gravitate toward the summer semester. We do have a required summer semester. And the summer semester is going to be our CTC 145 course, and it's called Advanced Laboratory Techniques. What I want you to think of with this class is organic on steroids. That's what this is. So if you look at the lineup that's over here to the left-hand side, you're seeing organic synthesis, reflux, fractionation, steam distillation, rotor evaporator, sublimation, recrystallization, and then things like Dean Stark and Soxalate extraction, things that bachelor's degree candidates have no clue what they are most of the time. And then once again, dissolution and disintegration. We have the equipment. Why not use it as much as possible? So we try to weave this in, even if it's just for one experiment, we try to weave it in as much as possible. And here it shows up again. So this is all about being independent. That is why it starts in the summer. So students are often given the following tasks. Number one, of course, you've got to do the lab. You've got to be able to read the procedure, do the lab experiment and get that completely finished. Number two, they make their own solutions, folks. We do not do that for them. So this is the semester where we do not baby them any longer. If they are following a laboratory procedure and it says you need to use three molar hydrochloric acid, they're going to make the three molar before they even get to do the lab experiment because that is the purpose of the summer class. That is the purpose of our program. And you want those types of people when you hire them in your laboratory working. You do not want to baby anyone. And and that is the purpose and the format of the CTC 145 course. It gives students the first time opportunity to prove themselves that they can use everything that they've learned in 115 and 114 and the standards and solutions 150 class to show us that they have walked away and, and know what they're doing. Uh, next, they also set up their own glassware. So again, we do not do anything for them. If they have to do a Dean Stark, they set it up, they break it down, they clean it, they make sure it's put back away. Uh, the same way with the Soxlid extraction, they find out where it's at, they put it together themselves, they wash it, they clean it, they put it back to where it came from, as well as all, again, of the reagents and the solutions that's needed for all of these experiments. So for instance, something that is done in the summer course, uh, with our fractionation, uh, students actually end up making their own small portion of moonshine. So they allow uh, yeast and sugar to ferment, and then they use fractionation 
in order to distill over their ethanol and then they will use our GC system to figure out what percentage of ethanol there's present in that uh, particular sample. They can use density to do that as well. A number of different things that they could use to prove the purity and the quality of the products that they are doing here. Uh, sublimation, uh, well students are synthesizing their own camphor and then at the very end of this they kind of do uh, some laboratory tests to see if it's pure and if so how pure is it steam distillation we bring in um, cloves and students crush cloves up and they extract eugenol which is the active component of clove oil up and over through the process of steam distillation and they can compare that to fractionation and simple pot distillation that they also experience throughout the semester uh, dean stark well for the dean stark experiment for this particular semester we have them to bring in a fruit or a vegetable and we get them to chop it and crush it up and we put it into a dean stark apparatus and they extract the water content from that food item. The soxalate extraction, very similar. We dabble in the food world just a little bit, and students actually take raw peanuts, chop them up, and then they put them into the soxalate extractor, and they extract all of the peanut oil that might be present from the peanuts. And then they compare that with the Merck information data, the Merck index. Students, yes, they wipe the dust off of those books, and they find peanuts in the Merck index, and it tells them the percentage of peanut oil that should be present. And then they kind of compare their data to to what we have here. Uh, so the advanced laboratory technique, how is this structured? Uh, this is also two hours per week. Um, and then with this, we also have a total of 10 hours per week for laboratory. And this means that students are seeing us on a normal semester for 12 hours a week. However, this is the summer and that summer is basically accelerated. So what we will end up seeing here is students will be in our laboratory for 16 hours throughout our summer semester per week doing very heavy organic related glassware setup, extractions, synthesis, solution preparation. So that's like a part-time job here um, if they worked for you as an employee. All right, so there's our 145. Uh, next up is our CTC 210. This is typically in the fall semester part two of the program. Uh, students do have to finish at least some of our prior coursework before enrolling in the forensic chemistry class. We want them to bring the basics to the laboratory with them and we just aren't going to take anyone with no background at all and slap them into a forensic chemistry class. Uh, this course is broken down into a couple of different sections. Uh, first, uh, we normally start off with blood-related laboratories, and then we go to drug-related laboratories, and then a little bit of electrophoresis with DNA type of work, and then some special topics like arson investigation and gunshot residue that's down below. Uh, gunshot residue, we have made it do with the AA instrument. This is much better probably on an ICP, but we do not have an ICP in our laboratory. It's one of the things that we are missing. So if you know how to get a hold of one, you need to let us know. Uh, now keep in mind, our budget's not that expensive or that high, but if you know how to get a hold of an ICP for us, please share that information. We would love to have a working one in our laboratory. Uh, arson investigation, this is typically a GCMS run. Uh, students will basically take burnt wood splints and they will release uh, the organics that have been used to, to set that wood splint on fire. And then they will identify it, hopefully with GCMS, or identify the components, because there could be more than one, and then classify the type of fire accelerant that they will, uh, that that person probably used to make the house burn up or whatever they're going to do with it. Electrophoresis and DNA work. Uh, we don't do a lot of biotechnology type of things. That's not really what our program is about. Our program is more chemical analysis side. But electrophoresis and DNA is something that we have integrated into the course. And they do do a, a handful of weeks of electrophoresis type of laboratory experiments. So I like to say that we are uh, the Mari Povich show. And who's the baby's daddy? We do those types of experiments. And we also do 
a little bit of our own DNA work for um, our personal DNA ladder, maybe. And we also look at crime scene investigations. So can we match a suspect up to the crime scene if we have a blood sample or a DNA sample from, from the scene of the crime? Uh, UNODC, cocaine methods and urinalysis. This is our drug kind of uh, month that we do. Uh, it's actually longer than a month because the cocaine takes about one month to complete. Uh, th this is, we follow very, uh, almost all of them, uh, the UNODC cocaine methods that are embedded in that booklet of information. Uh, there's only a few that we do not do, but we do walk students through the quantitative and qualitative test that we can do with cocaine. Um, and, you know, they probably have 16, 17 different unknown watt powders that they will undergo all of the testing with. Uh, and then hopefully in the end of this, they will maybe narrow that down and maybe prove that some of these other white powders were phony cocaine samples and then maybe come to the conclusion that one might be possible. Urinalysis is the same way. It's all about the pee, folks. So if we take a pee sample or a urine sample, uh, can we analyze that urine sample and detect what types of illicit drugs might be present in the urine? Uh, blood alcohol, it's all about headspace, GCFID here. And uh, students do prep their own samples. We use real blood. We do spock it with some alcohol to make sure that somebody's drunk. Otherwise, the lab's not very fun. And then we analyze those blood samples on our headspace system in our laboratory. Blood identification and topping. You know, a lot of students don't even know what their blood type is. And this is a chance for them to kind of start the semester off realizing what we can find in blood, which is very important because that's the driving force with the first part of the uh, forensic chemistry class. So the way this course is broken up, it is one lecture hour per week, and it's three lab hours per week, giving them a total of four hours every single week with the forensic chemistry. It is a lower credit course because we can only do so much, and then at the same time, we want to free their time up to more important classes that are not so specific like the forensic chemistry class, right? Uh, next up is our CTC 240 spectroscopy course. All right, so this is also fall and typically second uh, uh, second year. And with the spectro spectroscopy class, uh, it's just all about spectra, right? Uh, UV, Viz, FTIR, AAAE, ICP, MS. Uh, notice what is missing is NMR. Yes, we do not talk about NMR in ChemTech with this particular course. Number one, we do not have an NMR in our laboratory. And then number two, a lot of times the organic chemistry class that students have to take have NMR lecture. So the NMR lecture portion is going to be typically in a Chem 252 class at Cape Fear. So they're going to get it, they're just not with us. And this allows us to have our four major workhorse spectra instruments for the entire semester. And that means that each one of these we will spend about one month on. And when I say one month, I mean, we really go into detail with this equipment, folks. So, for instance, with the AAAE, right, these, we in the classroom setting will go through the theory of how this instrument works, how does it do its job, how can we make it better, how can we make sure that our data is actually legitimate, and then a part of that is also going into the laboratory and taking the machines apart and putting them back together. OK, so we go above the, the normal bachelor's route because at a bachelor's route, what you would often see these students do is that they will make samples and then they will make samples and put them in an auto sampler tray and give them to a TA. And the TA will often run them, get the data and bring the data back. That is not how we do business. In our program, the students are making their samples and then they batch those samples with quality control samples and they will fill out their own batches and they will run the samples themselves 
So that means they start the machines up, they shut the machines down. They have hands-on experience with the software, generating data using the software, how to print reports using the software, how to get software to maybe do calibration curves for them. They are hands-on from the very beginning of the process to the very end of the process. And with AA and AE, Folks, we are teaching them how to load lamps up on the machine. We're teaching them how to align the lamps. We're teaching them how to align the burner. Yes, that's a chicken scratch for burner. We are teaching them everything that we can as far as basic instrument operation. So I want you to think of those people that might be in your laboratory that are metrologists, people that are going around to equipment, making sure that that equipment is functioning the proper way. And if not, what can be done to fix it? It's all about troubleshooting. So that is a large part of this course. Now, I want you to take a bigger step back and take a look at what this class is. It is all about sample prep all over again. It's about quality control being included into instrumentation like standard editions and internal standards and duplicates and surrogates. And then we are also tackling the aspect of making the machine work and ensuring that it's working the proper way. And if it's not, what are things that we can do as analysts to make it work to save your company money from calling an instrumentation supplier and having them come and fix it maybe for you, especially if it's something simple and little that we can all do ourselves. So that is the purpose of the spectroscopy course. So for that reason, this CTC 240 class has eight hours of lab that's associated with it. And we have two hours of lecture per week. So this one class alone, students are seeing us for 10 hours a week for 16 weeks. One month on UV, one month on infrared, one month on atomic absorption and emission, and one month on mass spectroscopy. All right, so that's a little bit about our 240. Um, so now after the fall semester has ended, we now um, go into the spring semester, and this is spring two. All right, so for spring two, this is our food chemistry class, CTC 235. And folks, it's another specialized course like forensics. So because of that, the credit load is a little bit lower. So students will have this course for one hour of lecture a week and three hours of lab per week, giving us a total of four hours with us for this one course. It's all about the food industry. I like to say that this is a very sneaky way of introducing biochemistry here. Uh, you know, we introduce the idea and the structures and the properties of carbohydrates and proteins and lipids. That is really how this class is designed with the aspect of relating those to maybe the nutrition label on a food product. So what can we do in a laboratory if we were working in the food industry in a laboratory to do some data crunching in order to get the values that you see on the back of a nutrition label? That is what this class is all about. So this class, if you look at some of the topics, we're looking at moisture, of course, vitamins, both with titrations and HPLC, carbohydrates as well. Uh, carbohydrates, HPLC uh, also shows up here, as well as uh, some UV carbohydrate work. And I want you to think of maybe uh, one day I'm bringing in like 12 different brands of honey and students are processing these honey samples and they're measuring the amount of glucose and they're measuring the amount of fructose in the honey samples. And they're looking at the percentages that show up on the chromatograms and they're figuring out which one of these are real honey and which one of these are fake honey. Did I bring in an agave sweetener to how to trick them? And if so, can they prove that? Can they pick out which one is the phony one out of the bunch. Uh, the lipids, uh, these lipids are all about fats and the fats are great for soxalate. 
So with this particular experiment, you know, one day I'm bringing in multiple different brands of hamburger meat that's been ground up at the grocery store. So I'm bringing in an 80-20 and then I'm bringing in maybe like a 93 and 7 and then students are processing these samples that are meant to be different and they're calculating the amount of fat that's associated with that food product and they are matching that to the food label that's stated in the grocery store. Are they lying to us? That is what this course is all about. Uh, protein work. Uh, protein is all about, well, TKN here, the Keldahl method. So I'm bringing in milk samples. And with the milk samples, I'm going through and they're processing it using the Keldahl method. And they're calculating the total nitrogen content, which relates to the protein content, which relates to the nutritional value that you'll see on the product in the grocery store. Uh, we also spike some of the milk samples with things like melamine. And we do that for a reason because we want some of the answers to to seem very bogus just to see if they're doing the experiment the right way because they're processing mainly more than one sample at a time. Uh, various other topics are also brought into this course. So uh, GMO is something that we do with electrophoresis toward the end of the semester. Uh, we also have a lab on capsaicin. So I'm bringing in like 20 different hot sauces and students are extracting the capsaicin from the hot sauces. They're running that on HPLC and they're scientifically proving which hot sauces is the hottest based on the capsaicin levels. Those are the things that we do in the food chemistry course. It's also giving us an opportunity to talk quite a bit about the AOAC methods because that shows up for a lot of the laboratory experiments that we do. And that's kind of different than what students have seen in the prior coursework. Another particular lab experiment that we do here is olive oils. So I'll bring in 10 different brands of olive oils. Some are old, some are new, some are cheap, some are nasty, some are great. They're high dollars. Uh, but what students will realize is that even the high dollars are phony because olive oil and milk and honey are one of the top ringleaders of adulterated food items that are in the grocery store. So students are processing olive oils and we're running them on things like UV vis uh, in order to calculate is it really extra virgin or is it just regular old olive oil that's been sitting on the shelf for quite some time? Uh, those are the lab experiments, again, that these students are seeing from us. All right. Uh, next is our CTC 250 course. And our CTC 250 is all about chromatography. So this is identical to the 240, but this time this is in the spring part two semester. It's the same format and it is the same number of hours that we saw our 240 class. So our 250, two hours of lecture, eight hours of lab brings our total to 10 hours a week with this course. And it's all about chromatography. So column chromatography by hand. That's how we start the course. TLC, including HPTLC. That's right, folks. We have an HPTLC system on our campus that students will learn the ins and outs of. Thank you, KMAG, for partnering with us to allow that to happen. GC, TCD, FID, and MS. Uh, headspace systems for GC, purge and trap systems for GC, HPLC, and IC toward the very end of the semester. Again, the same format. We do labs. They process batches. They use the software. They start the machine up. They shut the machine down. They do their own data analysis at the end, very heavily using Excel. We don't even show them how the software can do it sometimes. We want them to work for it. And then something like GC systems, again, one month, one month on HPTLC, one month on GC, one month on HPLC, one month on IC, these students are taking apart the machines and putting them back together. So, for instance, with the GC section, well, we're talking to them about how to change the septum, how to change the glass insert, uh, how to make sure that the machine is not contaminated from sample to sample and how to keep it clean, how to install a column, how to cut a column, how to install it in the detector side, how to make sure that they don't have any leaks once that installation gets done. What is a ferrule? All of these things are coming along with the GC and the other instrumentation lectures that students see throughout the semester. Finally, our very last class, which is also spring semester, semester part two 
is our 260 course. And our 260 course is called the capstone course. So two things have to happen here. One, they meet with us one hour of lecture a week and then three hours of lab per week. From day one of this particular class for that semester, we start a full-blown water study. So we review all of the methods that we want them to do with drinking water mainly, and that includes pH, water hardness, uh, conductivity, turbidity, TSS, TDS, uh, anions using the IC system, so method 300.1 again, method 415 using total organic carbon, method 524 and 525 using the purge and trap system for volatiles, using the uh, solid phase extraction cartridges for the semi-volatiles on the mass spec systems. They go through all of that themselves. They are treated like an employee in this particular class. So everything is not made for them. Nothing's set out for them. They have to be independent. They have to do what they need to do, and they got to get it done by the end of the semester. The same thing happens with their independent research project that they will also pick for this particular semester. So in the very beginning of the semester, they will give us an idea of what they would like to do on their own, some type of topic, maybe some type of lab experiment that they've not had a chance to do or that they want to know more about. So they will do a little research. They will develop methods. They will go from the very basics of creation all the way through until it gets completed. And then with that comes formal reports and a formal presentation at the end of the semester. So students are writing an actual paper to submit for review, and they also have to present what they did as well as what they found to the entire classroom in a formal type of setting with our formal report and presentation section. All right. So environmental people, I don't want you to feel left out because this is our sneaky way of doing an environmental class because that is what our water study is focused on, even including things like THMs. We do that on our GCMS, so students can go down to those part per billion levels, and we follow that method as it's written, including the quality control parameters and everything else uh, with this particular semester. They just have to do it on their own. All right, so that is our coursework as a whole. Now, what I have not discussed is this idea that we have um, uh, you know, two routes that these students can choose from. And these two routes are the AAS degree, Associates of Applied Science, and our diploma. The diploma does not require any chemistry course at all at the college. So 151 and 152, these students do not take those. And 251 and 252, the students do not take those either. This is our general chemistry and organic chemistry transfer courses. So we will often tell students, if you're apprehensive about what we do, maybe you'll enroll in the diploma program. This will give you an idea of laboratory work. It will give you a um, chance to kind of put your toes in the water as far as what this field is going to do. And if you feel comfortable, then you can go and pursue the AAS degree. That way we're not scaring students off. However, if you feel comfortable with chemistry and math, and you're not shying away from those courses, we see the majority of their students automatically signing up for the AAS. And that's why. They know that this is what they want to do. They know they want to work in a laboratory. They're not taking chemistry and general chemistry because they've got to take it for another program. They're taking it because that's what they want to do in real life, which makes them a better employee for your company. So the AAS degree is typically the majority of our graduates but we do have a diploma option for those that might stray away from our program and just would like to get a feeling of what this is going to be like before they make the full-blown commitment. So this is called the advisory board for a reason, and that's because we need your advice, right? So here you'll see a list of questions on the screen. And what will happen is that Shawnee will reach out to you and she will schedule maybe a one-on-one -on -one meeting at your site location or on campus. Or it doesn't have to be a one-on-one -on -one meeting. It can be you and a group of other people that you want to be present. That's perfectly fine. 
but we need your advice and we need your guidance. And these are some of the questions that I want you to think about before that meeting takes place. Number one, do you think that our classes represent your industry and field? So are you working in a company? And if so, what is the nature of your company? And would the classes that you have seen in the previous slides, would they be relevant today with what you are doing or what a laboratory worker would do at your site of employment? If not, then we need to know that. We need to know what we can do better to represent you and your company and what kind of processes or laboratory training that we can incorporate into our program to make our students streamline into you a little bit better. All right. Uh, number two, think about your current workforce, the people that are already working for you. Is there a chance that any of them would benefit from our coursework, our laboratory training, our exposure? So for instance, we have an HPTLC instrument. So if you had employees that have never used HPTLC, and if you had employees that maybe would be using HPTLC in the future, or you think it's just good for them to know that information, would you consider having your employees take our courses? You know, we often will say, well, we see students first and students take the program at the college and then they graduate and they get a job and that's where you come in. But, you know, it also goes the other way. If people already have a job, they can always be better at their job. They can always learn things that they've not learned before or they have no clue of how to use. And that is the purpose of our program, and that's the purpose of some of our courses. So would your current workforce benefit from things like certificates? Maybe just like one course completion, that's it. But certificates are going to be kind of important. Because let's say that I'm at a pharmaceutical company, and I want, I think it's important, for my people to learn more about pharmaceutical related testing, because maybe that's something that's left off with a bachelor's degree level or a master's degree level candidate. So do you need us to make a certificate that will include a handful of classes, not a full blown degree, but a handful of classes that students can work toward and earn and maybe have that lead into job promotions at your location, or maybe a bonus at your job location. Is that something that you would be interested in or something that you would like to have that discussion with us? Because if so, we would love to have those with you. So pharma specialization, I'll show you in just a minute what I mean by that. Environmental specialization, that's also something, right? We've got environmental labs in town. We can't ignore them. So would a chemical technology degree be okay? Or would you like for students to pursue on and get a certificate in a specialized role that is relevant to your job and your kind of type of work? And with those certificates, would you encourage your current employees to come to us and enroll in those certificates and work toward that certificate completion and have that embedded into some type of job growth at your company? Uh, number three, uh, any classes that you feel that are missing? You know, I've talked about now for 45, 50 minutes about courses that we offer in our program as of right now. Uh, were we missing something? Is everything kind of represented? We need to know that information from you. So if you do feel that we are missing something, if it is a laboratory topic, then folks, that's great. We can integrate that into current coursework, and we've done that before. So for instance, we have heard now from a local pharmaceutical company that system suitability tests are going to be very important. People do not know what system suitability tests are when they hire them. So what we've done is we've taken that information and we're now integrating system suitability tests in our program so our graduates will know what those are. We can't make those decisions without your guidance and advice. If you think that it's more than just the topic, then are we missing full-blown classes from the program? Is there something that you would like for us to adapt? And then number four, I want you to think about trends. 
Um, is there a particular type of test that you are finding yourselves doing more and more and more and more of? Is it a common method? And if it is a common method, you need to let us know about it. So that way our students can do that method too and be familiar with it by the time they leave our graduation steps. Um, you know, if you are doing some type of test with some type of water sample in your laboratory and you're finding that a lot of the testing is centered around that one method and that one SOP is getting followed throughout the day, every day, all day long, let us know because we would love to adapt those types of laboratory experiments in our program. So as far as approved courses, you know, what am I talking about here? Well, the discussion needs to start with you. And you tell us what you need out of your employees. And then we can search the state database of courses and we can find something that maybe is a little bit more relevant. So for instance, right now we have a BTC 182. That's called Pharma Lab Techniques. Look what it does. It covers the theory and technical aspects of dissolution and Carl Fisher titrations. I don't know about you, but I don't know very many bachelor's or master's candidates that have done Carl Fisher titrations or dissolution and disintegration. But this course is already approved at the state level. We just have to modify it and adapt it down into a program. There's very little work that we have to do here. So if you looked at this lineup of courses and you were like, you know, I think that our employees are missing dissolution testing and Carl Fisher information, and I would like for them to work toward a pharmaceutical type of certificate at your um, uh, program or at your college, bring them on. We would love to have them. And in exchange for that, they can earn a certificate for the pharmaceutical related laboratory environment. And that certificate could qualify them for maybe different job roles at your company. We would love to have that type of relationship with you, especially with our certificates. These certificates can be offered in the evening and they can be offered on the weekend. If you have a four day work week and you just want like a Friday and a Saturday, then so be it. Bring them on. We can make it happen. BTC 183, look at this one. HPLC performed during drug stability testing. Are we getting any kind of breakdown of the drug, any kind of impurity that we need to pick up on? That's what this class is all about. Uh, ENV 212 and 214. Look at this one. Instrumentation for the environmental lab. Specifically focused on environmental testing, specifically focused on methods that a student would see in an environmental laboratory. We can create a whole certificate with that. Can we adapt just this one course right now? The answer is yes. We can bring that into our current Chemtech program and not do a certificate if that's all that you need. The problem, though, is that if one goes in, one has to come out. So which class would we sacrifice to bring a new class into the picture? And then 214, look, this is all straight up water quality. Course examines constituents of natural waters, including procedures and testing. So all of the environmental methods that follow water quality tests right there. So again, CFPUA advisory board members, Pender Utilities advisory board members, if you're working in water, wastewater facilities, this is something that we can make happen for you. But we need your input, we need your guidance, and we need your advice. All right. So this concludes part one of our advisory board meeting. So again, my name is Tracy Holbrook. I'm the program director here at Cape Fear Community College. I've been with the ChemTech program for over 15 years at this moment. And in the second video, you're going to learn all about our instrumentation. So now that you're watching these videos, I want you to think about those questions. Shawnee or someone from our ChemTech program will be reaching out. And that meeting, we hope, will take place really soon. And we can have those discussions with you. We can sit down one-on-one -on -one and you can tell us what you are after in an employee and what you think our program is missing. Because that's what this is all about. Again, you are the advisory board. And we need your leadership. We need your guidance and expertise. And once more, I want to thank you for serving on the advisory board. Because without you we would not have that leadership or that advice to make our program even better in the future years. So if you've got questions, please reach out to me, let me know. And uh, until then, I'll see you in part two, where we'll talk about our instrumentation. Hope you're having a good day.